I'm Nathan Hobby, biographer of Catherine Susanna Pritchard, who was a great Australian novelist and a prominent communist. This second part of Catherine's life is about her prime from 1919 to 1933. Catherine and Hugo Frostel were a celebrity couple when they settled in Perth in 1919. Revolution was in the air after the Great War and Catherine threw herself into political activism, fighting as she saw it to restructure society so that capitalists would not take the world into another war for the sake of profit. When the Communist Party of Australia was created in 1920, she was given the task of forming a branch in Perth. She wore herself out, giving speeches and organizing a study circle. Her writing took a back seat. The flurry of activity made her sick and her health worsened further when she fell pregnant. At the end of 1921, after a hectic few years, she withdrew from political activity. Rick, Catherine and Hugo's only child was born in 1922. They had settled in a cottage in Greenmount on a hill on the outskirts of Perth. After the first two demanding years of motherhood, Catherine refocused on her writing. She was at her literary peak from 1924 to 1929, producing her most famous works in an extraordinary season of creativity. She made it her signature method to take research trips to learn about life in Australian places. The first of this period was a trip to the Southwest Cary Forests around Pemberton. From it, she wrote Working Bullocks, published in 1926, a poetic, sensual love story about timber workers and their families. Working Bullocks was acclaimed by writers and critics. Miles Franklin said its publication was like the breaking of a drought in Australian literature. Catherine's 1926 trip to the Tari cattle station in the Pilbara was the basis of her award-winning 1929 novel, Coonadoo, her award-winning play, Brumby Innes, and her famous stories, The Kubu and Happiness. In all of these, she depicted the struggle of white station workers in the harsh land and their interactions with Aboriginal people. At the time, she was attacked for painting too negative a picture of white people's treatment of Aboriginal people. Later, she was acclaimed for being ahead of her time. Now it's increasingly recognized that these works inevitably also reflect problematic attitudes of her time. In 1927, she traveled with Worth Circus for two weeks through WA's Wheat Belt and Midwest. From it came her 1930 book, Haxby's Circus, a novel with strong feminist themes about an acrobat struggle against her tyrannical father, the ringmaster of the circus. It is a tragic yet resolute novel set over decades in locations around the back blocks of Australia. In 1929, she was halfway through another novel, Intimate Strangers, when she put it aside, creatively exhausted. The novel is about a troubled marriage, the first half set before the depression and the second half during it. Although she insisted it was not autobiographical, the strain in the character's marriage reflects strains in Catherine and Hugo's own marriage. Hugo had bought up 22 properties and was in financial trouble as well as suffering depression. While he was obsessed with making money, Catherine reimmersed herself in the Communist Party, putting herself at the front line of protests, giving speeches and helping to produce the local party newspaper. In 1933, Catherine's sister sent her money so she could join her on a holiday in London. Catherine took it as an opportunity to sneak into Russia and see for herself what communism could do for a nation. Traveling across the vast Russian landscape, she was impressed by the rapid industrialization and improvements in living conditions, claiming in a series of articles that what she saw was proof communism worked. She expressed no criticisms of Stalin's Soviet Union, even though it was in the midst of brutal forced collectivization of farms, which caused terrible famine. In November, when she reached London for the voyage back to Australia, she read in a newspaper that Hugo had killed himself. While she was away, his scheme to put on a rodeo show in his back paddock, hoping to make money on admission and sell some of the properties in Greenmount at the same time, hadn't been the success he'd claimed in his letters to her in Russia. The properties remained unsold, his debts had worsened, and with Catherine returning soon, after a sleepless night, 
he shot himself with his service revolver on the veranda. Catherine turned 50 on the voyage back home. She was a widow with huge debts and a son soon to start secondary school. She took solace in her beloved Rick, in her faith in communism and in her writing. Though she didn't feel like it, she still had many eventful years left to live, as you can hear in the final part. 